Perfect. So welcome to the Med Crash Course series. This is our finals Crash Course series covering sexual health. This is part two. Um, if you're watching online on YouTube, please check out uh, part one as this is our two part series. Um, scan the QR code in the top right corner for our social medias and in the chat I will be posting a link that um, takes you to the ability to answer all of the polls that our lovely tutor will be going through with us today. Um, if you are watching on YouTube um, or in live in person at the moment, there's a feedback form to fill out at the end of the session. Once you fill out that form, it will take you immediately to the slides for this session. OK, so with the link posting in the chat now, there we go up on the screen. I will hand it over to Dr. Nazifa to do part two of sexual health. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for that intro. So my name is Nazifa. I'm an F1 working at North London. Uh, today I'm doing the second part of the sexual health teaching. Uh, last week I did a teaching on HIV, hepatitis and syphilis, uh, which are kind of like the big three topics in sexual health. Um, and so if you missed that, then um, it is up on YouTube so you can have a, a listen at that. Um, today I'm going to be covering the rest of the sexual health topics and then I will also be covering contraception at the end. So let's get started with our first SBA. Um, a 21 year old woman presents to her GP with offensive vaginal discharge and itchiness. On examination, there is white curd like discharge and redness. What is the most likely diagnosis? I'm going to give you guys around 30 seconds to answer that question. Um, I don't know if you can actually see, I can't see the final poll uh, percentages of what majority of people have answered on Levox. Are you able to see it now? I've pressed show results. Mm. No. Would you be able to just tell me if that's OK? I can't actually. Oh, now I see it. OK, so majority of you guys have answered A, candiditis, and that is correct. Yeah. So what gives this SBA question away is the fact that you've got this white curdy discharge. And whenever you see that, especially in SBA land, you think of candidiasis. Um, by the way, my pronunciation for some of the, these words is going to be so awful, so I apologise in advance. Um, B, bacterial vaginosis, and we're going to talk about this a bit more afterwards, um, you would expect, expect a fishy odour. And then colour can tend to be grey, it can be white as well, but it tends to be homogenous in nature. Um, you don't get this curd-like consistency. Chlamydia, again, you would actually, start, most of the times it's asymptomatic, but you would expect more kind of uh, symptoms around uh, urethral discharge, pain on passing urine, and uh, sort of um, a greater history, essentially. Gonorrhea as well may present similarly to chlamydia, and trichomonas, which is another STI which we'll be covering. Again, the um, key thing in here with the discharge will be seen as being a frothy yellow and vaginal discharge. And you might get something called a strawberry cervix, which is something I'll be talking about a little bit later. So candidiasis, it's caused by a yeast infection from Candida albicans. That's what the majority of these infections are caused by. About 5% of candidiasis infection is caused by uh, Candida glabatra. Um, that is a much more harder to treat yeast. Um, and if someone's infected with this kind of yeast infection, it comes under a complicated candidiasis infection. Now, there are a few predisposing factors you should be aware of, um, not only in clinical practice, but also for the sake of finals in SBA land, because when you see these, you might want to think about candid candidiasis infection. So that's things like uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. Diabetes uh, puts people at risk of yeast infections, immunosuppressions, um, immunosuppressive disorders such as HIV and steroids um, itself can also be immunosuppressive. 
uh, pregnancy and high dose oral contraceptive pills can also put people at risk of candidiasis because of the fact that um, it increases the estrogen levels in your body and that is directly correlated to increase in uh, candida infection and things like vaginal douche, douching, bubble baths, shower gels and tight clothing. So things that can essentially affect the kind of um, flora of the area of the vaginal area um, can increase your risk of these yeast infections. And the presentation, typically you would get this curdy white discharge and you would be associated with this itchiness and redness around the vagina. But you don't tend to get this um, strong fishy odour as you would do in, say, a bacterial vaginosis. So there's a few investigations that you can do. Number one, um, it's the one investigation you can do is a vaginal pH test. And you would do this, you could potentially do this if you were examining the woman um, where you were present, present, uh, potentially considering candida infection and essentially you would take uh, swabs from the vaginal wall um, and you would test their pH, it's a bit of a rogue one, but what you could see on the bedside at least is that for candida infections, so yeast infections, their pH would be less or equal to 4.5. With bacterial vaginosis, their pH would be above 4.5. And same for tr uh, trichomonas, their pH would be above 4.5. Um, what you could also do is a high vaginal swab. So that's when you take a swab and you put it into the vagina about five centimetres inside and then you take their swab and you can put this under microscopy and culture and you would see pseudo hyphae. So that's the picture here that I'm showing you. That's what you, could, you would see under microscopy. Um, and the few other investigations that you might want to do alongside someone who has presented with candida infection is number one, you might want to do a urine sample if you're suspecting a UTI on top of the yeast infection. A hba one test, so that's testing essentially for diabetes, and you might want to do that particularly if someone is coming with recurrent candida infections, because then you are thinking, okay, why are they coming again and again with these yeast infections? Do they have other predisposing uh, risk factors that make them prone to these kind of yeast infections? So that's when you might want to be considering to testing for diabetes. You also might want to do full STI screening, and that may be dependent on the history, and again, if they're coming along with recurrent candida infections. The management for it is quite basic, so you would want to, most of the times you would want to give intravaginal antifungal cream or pessaries, and you may want to give oral antifungals as well, particularly if um, they are coming in with recurrent yeast infections. But for pregnant women, um, and as well for breastfeeding women, you do not want to give them oral antifungals because there is a contraindication to it, um, and instead you want to go down the intravaginal or pessary route um, in regards to the antifungal antifungals that you would want to treat them with. SBA2, by the way, if you guys have any questions or anything like that, just pop them in the chat. Or if you want me to slow down, just let me know. A 30-year-old woman attends the sexual health clinic after noticing changes to her vaginal discharge accompanied by a fishy odour. She describes the discharge as thinner and white grey in colour. Following a full examination, a vaginal swab is taken and the following is found on microscopy with gram staining. I'll give you guys 30 seconds. I think I pretty much gave the answer to this. Okay, so the majority of you guys put well done. Yeah, the answer is D. So, um, basically, said before as well, the fishy odor, uh, the thinner and white grain discharge is screaming out to you bacterial vaginosis, of which is treated by metronidazole. The picture that you can see here under microscopy is known as clue cells. Um, and I'm going to talk about them in a bit uh, in a while, but that's a typical image that you might see under bacterial vaginosis. It's not um, intermittent. Uh, 
Intramuscular benze benzathine penicillin is a treatment for syphilis, of which there's no suggestion. Oral doxycycline is a treatment for chlamydia. And again, um, you would expect either asympto uh, asymptomatic, uh, a patient who's asymptomatic, sorry, or you might get other things like what we described, the urethral discharge, um, or um, in potentially with the women, things like painful periods, pain after having sex, other more general symptoms. Um, we've already discussed candida infections, and yes, this is not warts. So bacterial vaginosis is caused by uh, Gardenella vagina, vagina, vaginalis. I'm not saying that right, but <laughs> forgive me. Uh, the presentation is, as I mentioned, the offensive fishy smelly discharge. Um, and the discharge tends to be white or yellow. It can be grey as well, and it's homogenous, um, meaning it's kind of just this one colour. Uh, that you get throughout the discharge. Sometimes it's described like a milky-like consistency, which is a bit weird, but there you go. That's how some people might want to describe it. And you might particularly notice it around uh, the times of your period or after sex. Um, the diagnosis, again, you can do your vi vaginal pH testing. And as we mentioned, for bacterial vaginosis, you expect a pH above 4.5. Um, you also clinical examination, you might want to look at their discharge, although that's not very specific. There is something called the WIF test, which is quite crude um, in the way that it's described. But essentially, you put 10% of potassium chloride on the discharge. Uh, so say, for example, if you get a sample of the discharge and you decide to put potassium chloride in it, it would you would get like a very strong fishy odour coming out of it. Um, and that is a test that I guess was previously out there. I very much doubt they use that now. Uh, you will see the clue cells um, when you put them on a wet mount. So if you were on, if you were trying to see the discharge under microscopy, you can put them on a wet mount, which is, which is essentially a methodology for seeing um, certain specimens under microscopy, and you would see these clue cells, which is what I described here. Um, and on gram staining you might see a large number of gram positive and negative cocci with reduced or um, absent lactobacilli. Lactobacilli is a normal bacteria that you will see in healthy vaginal flora. And in bacterial vaginosis, you will see reduction in this. Um, and that again, might come up in SBAs saying on gram staining or under microscopy, you see this, the large number of gram positive, negative cocci and reduced lactobacilli. Again, the treatment is with oral metronidazole, um, or you can use intravaginal metronidazole gel, and you would use a similar treatment for pregnant women or for breastfeeding women. Um, so this is just a closer look up of the clue cells, um, and essentially you have these normal vaginal epithelial cells, and it's just covered by this bacteria around it, which obscures the border, and so that's what you might get. I don't know much, I'll be honest with you, I don't know much about the details about the microscopy, but if you see that, think bacterial vaginosis. Trichomonas is uh, one of the vaginal discharges that you need, to, one of the causes of vaginal discharges that you need to know of, and it is uh, seen as being an STI, and it's caused by a, a protozoan parasite uh, called Trichomonas um, yeah, something called trichomonas something, I forgot the uh, last name actually, but it's called by this parasite. Um, and the presentation of it, it again, you tend to get very itchy vagina. Um, the discharge, however, tends to be green or yellow in nature, at least in SBA land. And you get what's known as a strawberry cervix. And so what essentially that is, is where you get around in the cervical area, you get essentially hemorrhages, mini hemorrhages in the capillaries, which presents as the strawberry cervix. And I'll show you a picture in the next slide. But again, in SBA land, that's quite typical. You might see that coming up. The diagnosis is similar to what we've seen before, where you would, uh, where you can use a wet mount um, under microscopy or you can culture. Um, and in that, you might see numerous polymorphonuclear uh, cells and, and also particularly the flagella of the parasite. And because this is an STI, you do need to do a full STI screening. And particularly, you want to make sure you're ruling out gonorrhea because that can often coexist with trichomonas. The management is very similar to bacterial vaginosis in the sense that you use um, metronidazole. And again, you can use that as, um, oh, sorry, again, you can use that as, um, while you're pregnant or breastfeeding. And again, because it is STI, you do need to think about partner notification and treatment too. 
So this is what I mean about the um, strawberry cervix here. And so you basically get these small, small hemorrhages from capillaries that are leaking out um, as a result of the um, infection. And this is what I mean by the parasite. And you can get this kind of flagella under the um, under microscopy, you can see. And this is just a more zoomed out version um, under microscopy that you might see in a trichomonas infection. SBA3. A 23 year old man presents to his GP with discharge from his penis and pain on urination. The GP suspects a STI. Which diagnostic test will reveal the most likely cause? So this is quite a difficult one. It's very non-specific symptoms, but I'll give you some time to try to think what you, what you think might be the answer. OK, um, what have the majority majority of you guys put D? Yeah. So what this is suggesting the SBA is that this is a chlamydia infection. The reason why so it's very nonspecific. So it's discharge from his penis and pain and urination. Um, that's very nonspecific and you might be thinking of quite a few things. But number one, you need to think, OK, his age, 23 years old. Chlamydia is actually one of the is one of the most common STIs in the UK and a risk factor is actually being under 25. Um, and that is a risk factor written under NICE guidelines um, and it forms part of the screening programme. So the likelihood is with, alongside these non these relatively non-specific symptoms, um, the dysuria um, and the discharge from his penis, you're thinking the most likely it's going to be chlamydia. And yes, one of the diagnostic tests is a swab and a NAP test. Um, which is essentially, I believe, like PCR in a way. So chlamydia uh, is caused by chlamydia trachomatis. Trachomatis, however the hell you say that. But what it essentially is, is an obligate intracellular pathogen. And what that means, obligate means that it relies on a host in order to survive. So it needs to have a host cell in order to survive and replicate. And it also has implications in the way that it's diagnosed under microscopy. Uh, because you, you can't actually stain chlamydia with gram staining. You have to use a different type of staining to see it. Now, the screening program, um, again, uh, the, the current screening program that we have in the UK is that everyone under the age of 25 who is sexually active should consider being tested for chlamydia yearly or more frequently if they um, have regular partners or different partners um, over the years or so. And so that is... Um, what is recommended in the UK. Uh, there are other cases as well. So um, if you are under 25 and you've been treated for chlamydia in the previous three months, uh, you might want to be screened again for chlamydia. Uh, of course, you, if you have any concerns about uh, sexual exposure to chlamydia, the, the diagnostic tests have a window period of two weeks. And what that means is that if you have been exposed to chlamydia, uh, prior to two weeks ago, the test will pick up the fact that you have chlamydia. But if you've picked up chlamydia within two weeks and you come up as negative in your test, you would want to repeat that chlamydia test in another two weeks time because it will take up to two weeks to, for chlamydia to, to essentially show up in your body or to become or be picked up by the test that we have. Um, and you should also note that chlamydia is tested for um, under anyone who wants uh, an abortion. Um, and also um, they would test it for people who have two or more sexual partners in the past uh, 12 months. Um, or they can do if they want to have their chlamydia to be tested for chlamydia. The presentation is uh, what I've spoken about. So it's often asymptomatic. Um, and in men, if you are going to have symptoms, you might have the urethral discharge. You might have uh, pro 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 
proctitis, which is, which is essentially inflammation around the rectal lining. Uh, you might have epididymoorchitis, which is inflammation of your epididymitis, as well as your testicle, which is where the orchitis part comes from. And you might get Reiter syndrome. And so if you've done your rheumatology placement, so that is essentially arthritis, reactive arthritis, so inflammation in one of your joints. And the typical triad for Reiter syndrome is um, conjunctivitis, um, urethritis and arthritis. You might have seen Reiter syndrome come up in past mode. I remember seeing that coming up a lot. And in women, you might get pain on passing urine. You might get inflammation of the cervix. And you might get pain on having sex and this pelvic pain and cervical motion tenderness, which is essentially if you do a cervical swoop, um, they will have pain. Now, the diagnosis is known as a NAT test. And in women, you can do either a vulvovaginal swab. So that's inserting a swab five centimetres into the vagina. Or you can do an endocervical swab, which is taking a swab further up into the cervical area. Um, and in men, you would do a urine sample. That's the first line for investigation for men. You can do urethral discharge, although um, the sensitivity and uh, or the urine sample and the urethral discharge is basically the same. Um, so sometimes it can just be easier doing a urine sample. And this urine sample is a first catch urine, meaning you you make them hold their blood for at least an hour and then you take the first 20 millilitres of urine that comes out. You might also want to consider doing rectal swabs in uh, symptomatic men and women, so people who um, have sort of pain around the anal area. And you also might consider doing rectal swabs, particularly in men who have sex with men, because they are higher risk of um, STIs called um, LGV or lymphogranuloma venereum, something I will be discussing in a little bit, little bit later. And they're also just at higher risk of um, yeah, the higher risk of that and higher risk of further infections around the anal area. So you might want to take a swab, um, rectal swab. You can also do uh, tissue cultures. And again, as I said, chlamydia doesn't show up in gram staining. So you have to use this H&E stain and you'll see inclusion bodies and inclusion bodies look like that. Uh, I don't know. I don't really know uh, microscopy that well. But if you see inclusion bodies coming up in an SEA, think chlamydia. The management, so you would want to give doxycycline or you can give azithromycin or erythromycin. You want to use that particularly in pregnancy because you can't use doxycycline in pregnancy. And again, so SDR, you want to make sure you do contract tracing um, and you will offer a repeat testing for people under 25 if they've been diagnosed with chlamydia three to six months um, after a completion of treatment to test for any reinfection. Gonorrhea. So gonorrhea is another STI caused by a grand negative diplococcus neisseria gonorrhea. Um, and again, it can be quite similar presentation um, with chlamydia, except less, more symptoms. It's not always um, as asymptomatic as chlamydia is. And then again, you will get this urethral discharge, you get pain on passing urine. And in women, again, you'll get pain on having sex. You might get heavy periods, you might get this lower abdominal pain. And gonorrhea, particularly, you need to think about rectal infection, particularly in men who have sex in men, um, uh, because again, they are higher risk of gonorrhea caused by um, uh, rectal um, gonorrhea more in the rectal region. Um, men who have sex with men are at higher risk of that. Um, and so you, you should be thinking, particularly in this case, of taking swabs um, in all sites of infection, uh, which may have symptoms. So rectally and also in their fra uh, pharyn pharynx as well, you might consider wanting to take swabs um, more so than in chlamydia at least. And similar to chlamydia, the diagnosis through a NAT, NAT test, so you want to do a vulvovaginal swab in women. You don't want to do endocervical swabs and gonorrhea. And in men, again, you want to do first catch urine samples. Again, you can also do urethral swabs. Um, but this time in gonorrhea, you can see it under gram staining and you'll see gram negative diplococci. Gram negative, remember, uh, comes up, I believe, was it purple or pink, sorry, and gram positive comes up as purple. So in gonorrhea, you will see pink coloured uh, bacteria because it's gram negative. Management is actually a lot more simple. So you can do one dose of keftriaxone intramuscularly and you can give this um, 
to pregnant women. Second line is ciprofloxacin. Um, but remember that it's contraindicated in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, and if people have got allergy, needle phobia or um, contraindications, you can use this alternative with uh, cefixamine uh, plus with azithromycin. So this is a table. Um, so moving on from chlamydia and gonorrhea and all of the kind of urethral or vaginal discharges, I'm moving on to now a table looking at a few causes of ulcers, genital ulcers. Um, and there's quite a lot of few niche causes and there's a more causes that are a lot more common in the UK. So the more niche ones are donovanosis, um, LGV, so that was the lympho, uh, lymphogenerium, um, lymphogranulinoma venerium, sorry, and chancroid. Donor, so no, donor venosis, LGV, and chancroid, you don't really see in the UK that much. You see them more in tropical countries, but it's important just to be aware of. So donor venosis is caused by a, a bacterial Klebsiella, and in this you tend to get this beefy red hemorrhagic ulcer. If you see that in SBA, think of donovanosis, and you tend you don't really tend to get lymphadenopathy, and the treatment is with azithromycin, and you can give a bunch of other um, antibiotics as well. With syphilis, I described this last week. Um, you get what's known as a, a shanka, which is a painless ulcer, and you would get painless lymphadenopathy, and the treatment for that is intramuscular benz benzathine penicillin. LGV, which I mentioned, is a con uh, which is a complication of chlamydia or is a caused by a variant of chlamydia and is something you need to be aware of, particularly in men who have sex with men, pushing you to take rectal swabs, is you will get a painless ulcer, but you will get painful lymphadenopathy. And this ulcer can tend to occur three to ten days after infection um, and it might heal rapidly as well. And the treatment you can give is with doxycycline. A chancroid is caused by bacterium haemophilus and you get um, the single or multiple painful ulcers with painful lymphadenopathy. The reason I'm emphasising whether the ulcer is painless or painful or the lymphadenopathy is painless or painful is because sometimes it does come up in SBA and sometimes it, it is just useful knowing um, uh, how, how, how it presents, um, whether it's painless or not and the antibiotics you can use is keftaraxone. Now, genital warts is something caused by HPV 6 and HPV 11, and you might have, um, I believe, been vaccinated by some of these HPVs as well. Um, and that is usually asymptomatic. The ulcers or the warts itself um, can sometimes be singular. They can, can sometimes come up as clusters. Um, and actually, they, there isn't, you don't have to have treatment if you do have genital warts. Sometimes they just, they do just, go away by itself but if not there are certain creams that you can use uh, podophyllotoxin or imiquimod cream you can give. Now herpes is caused by HSV 1 or 2 and actually what you get in herpes you get a lot more um, generalized symptoms initially you might get fever you might get um, neuropathic symptoms like uh, tingling sensations you might get neuropathic pain and these these calls that you get, these kind of ulcers, they tend to be multiple and superficial in nature and they are painful. And the unfortunate thing with herpes is that there is no cure for it. So people who are do have herpes, they will have that lifelong, although over time there will be a reduction in the severity and frequency of um, the outbreaks that of the outbreaks of herpes that they have. But you do treat with, you can give um, acyclovir when, when they are going through an um, I guess, an outbreak phase in order to relieve some of those symptoms mm. as well. So I should give a warning, actually. Uh, these are some of the pictures of some of the ulcers I'm talking about. So up here, um, this is the beefy red um, hemorrhagic ulcer that you see in donovanosis. This is the picture of painful ulcers that you might see in the chancroid. This is the painless ulcers that you might see in LGV. Um, they tend to have this mucopurulent base. Uh, this is a variety of pictures of genital warts. Um, so as you can see, they can come up in clusters. They can um, they can come up in clusters, and they almost they describe this kind of water as being keratinized um, and 
horny, meaning you see these uh, kind of spikes within the within the genital warts. That's how sometimes it can be described. And over here, this is a picture of genital herpes. So you get these multiple superficial vesicles that can be painful um, in around their uh, genital region. And again, if, if my pain is painful thing kind of confused you, this is just the picture just to describe the kind of thought process you can go through. If you are having an SBA where they're describing all these ulcers and lymphadenopathy, so you can say, is this also painful? Yes, if there's multiple, you're thinking HSV. If it's not, if it's not multiple and it tends to be a singular one, alongside painful inguinal lymph nodes, you're thinking of it being a chancroid. If it's not a painful ulcer, um, and if there's not a pain for ulcers, it's either going to be LGV or syphilis, and then you need to differentiate between whether they've got painful lymph nodes or not. Again, a lot of these things can also be decided by the history and things like that. So this is just a picture that you can use if you if you wish. SBA4. So I think now we're moving on to the contraception side of the lecture. So a 40 year old woman is found to have new genital discharge, frothy green in nature. She is to be treated with oral metronidazole. The patient is keen to start contraception and asks for your advice. She experiences migraines with occasional visual disturbances. She would not mind a form of interuterine contraception or alternatively, if an injection option is offered, she would prefer as few injections as possible. Which is the most appropriate contraceptive method for this patient? I'll give you guys a bit of time to go through this. Um, if you haven't, covered contraception yet it might be a little bit difficult but um, I'll give you guys some time Should we go see what did everyone think? So see, yeah. Um, so what they are trying to get at with this SBA, with this dish dog, which is frothy green in nature, being treated by metronidazole, is a trichomonas infection. So she's got a vaginal infection, she's got an STI, um, or she has been treated for one. Um, so whenever you're thinking that, um, we'll talk about this a bit later, but you don't want to give any interuterine devices. So immediately E is ruled out. Um, she experienced migraines with occasional visual sub disturbances. And what that is trying to point out is a contraindication to combined oral contraceptive pills. Because if you get migraines with auras, which is what this history is suggesting, you can't give combined oral contraceptives. So that rules out A. Even though she doesn't mind a form of interuterine contraception, we've already ruled out she can't have that. Um, if she were to have an injection, she wants as few injections as possible. Um, the depot injection is given every 12 weeks or every three months, so that might not be her preference. The transdermal patch, again, that's a or that's a oral contraceptive method, a combined oral contraceptive method again. Sorry, and that, that means that's contraindicated because of the migraine with aura. So the only thing that leaves out is C, which is a progesterone only implant. So the combined methods, so underneath the combined methods for contraception uh, comes the combined oral pill, the transdermal patch and the vaginal pill. Um, and the way that these combined method works is that they have a combination of estrogen and progesterone. So what that does is it prevents ovulation. The progesterone side of it, also it prevents um, endometrial proliferation, which prevents implantation. And it can also thicken your cervical mucus, which kind of prevents uh, sperm from, I guess, coming through and causing fertilization. But the main way that it works is these combined methods is preventing ovulation and preventing trans uh, implantation. So the three types you have is the combined oral contraceptive pill, which is what most people will know about. And with the combined pill, you want to take one pill every day for 21 days and then you have a seven day break. 
and that is uh, a week where essentially you have your period or you have a bleed. If you, it's really important to note that if you start the pill within the first five days of your cycle, you don't need to use any additional um, uh, barrier methods like condoms. But if you start using the pill after your first five days of your cycles, you need to use condoms for seven days because the, these combined methods, they do not work immediately. The transdermal patch is a patch that you can put either in your arm, your buttocks, your abdomen. There's quite a few places that you can put it. And essentially with this uh, transdermal patch, um, you, you wear a patch every day for 21 days, but you change it every week. So every week you will change your patch for three weeks. And then in your last week or your fourth week, you will have again your bleed. So similar method to combine pill butts with a patch. And the vaginal ring, you insert in the vagina for 21 days and then you remove it for seven days. Um, the combined pill, so uh, a few SBAs that you might get or questions that you might get is around missed doses um, related to combined pills. So if you've missed your pill and it's been less than 24 hours no problem um just take the pill whenever you remember to take it for that day if you have missed one pill and it's been between 24 for 48 hours the pill that you've missed you need to take it as soon as possible and the pill that you have due for that day you should take that at its usual time if you've missed more than two pills and it's been more more than 48 hours you need to take your most recent pill as soon as possible and then your next pill at the same time as usual, plus you need to wear condoms for seven days. And depending on when you've missed your pill, you might need to consider emergency contraceptives. So if you've missed the pill and it's been the first week and, you, um, and you've had sex during this uh, pill-free interval, so during the time where you've missed your pill, if you've had sex during that time, you might want to consider emergency contraceptives. If it's your second week and you, that's the week that in which you've missed your pill, you don't need to have emergency contraceptive, providing you continue on taking your pills um, as they are due. And if it's your third week, you don't need to think about emergency contraceptives at all, but you can omit your pill free interval. So instead of having that week of bleeding or break, you just continue on taking the pills as normal. I hope that makes sense. Um, you guys can get these slides afterwards anyway, and you can read through it um, again just to see if that makes sense, because sometimes the missed pills can be a bit confusing. The great thing about combined pills is that it's very effective, sex isn't disturbed, um, and actually it has a, a secondary benefit, but sometimes it can make your period less painful and lighter, and actually combined pills are a um, is a treatment for menorrhagia, so heavy periods, um, and for painful periods as well. It can improve acne, and again, combined oral, oral contraceptive pills have been used as a treatment for people with acne. It reduces your risk of ovarian, endometrial, and colorectal cancer. It reduces your risk of these, um, particularly of ovarian cancer, just because it prevents ovulation, so that in of itself causes a reduction in ovarian cancer. And once you stop your combined pill, you can get your fertility back quite quickly. However, there are disadvantages. Again, no STI protection. So you would always recommend as clinicians to use condoms for safe sex because it won't prevent any STIs from being transmitted. It's a pill that you have to remember to take. So that can be really annoying, um, which again is a huge disadvantage. There are side effects like headaches, migraines, mood changes, nausea and bloating. Um, and that is something that you need to counsel people on. It can increase your, your, your blood pressure. And there is a contraindication with hypertension and taking these combined pills. And it can increase your risk of um, VTE, so stroke, uh, strokes. Uh, no, not strokes, I'm not saying that wrong. It can increase your risk of clots. It can increase your risk of heart attacks and strokes, as well as breast, cervical and liver cancer. And if you do have an OSCE scenario, particularly when you are trying to go through um, contraceptive counselling, it is important that you do mention some of these risks because you do need to speak about um, symptoms that they should be aware of, of which they should um, contact 
emergency services. So, for example, if you have an OSCE station where someone is wanting combined pills and you can give it to them, you need to make sure you tell them if you start getting um, shortness of breath, if you start getting pain in particularly unilateral pain in your leg, um, you need to think about you know, get, attending potentially emergency services because they are at increased risk of these clots um, and um, heart attacks. So that's something that you do need to um, counsel people on. Now, there's a list of contraindications and you do need to know them, not only for clinical practice, but because this is also specifically for finals in OSCE scenarios, you do need to make sure that you are asking them about whether they do have any of these contraindications. And the way that we have it in the system, we have this UK MEC system. So uh, UK MEC 4 means it's an absolute contraindication. So under no circumstances, circumstances should you give them the combined pill. UK MEC 3 is where the disadvantages generally outweigh the advantages so they don't recommend taking it and UK MEC 2 so level 2 means that the advantages outweigh the disadvantages so you can give it to them but give it to them with caution and I'm not going to go through all of these but specifically in SBA land you need to first of all rule out if they've been if they've given birth recently you want to make sure you ask them if they smoke you want to make sure you ask them about migraine symptoms and visual symptoms, and you want to ask them about hypertension and breast cancer too, uh, because these are some of the big things that you want to make sure you're ruling out um, in your history taking when considering giving someone um, combined pills. There are a few other things as well that you can ask, but in general, those are the contraindications. Moving on to the second type of combined uh, contraceptive pills is the progesterone only methods. And so in this category, you have three types. You have your progesterone only pill, you've got your progesterone implant and you have your depot injections. And the way that these progesterone methods work um, actually varies depending on the type. So um, with the mini pill, you now have two categories. You have your traditional type, uh, which has norethiestrone. I'm saying that so badly. And you have this newer type called desigestrol. Now, the reason why the newer type is better uh, to an extent is because they have different window periods. So with the traditional type, they have a window period of three hours, meaning if you delayed taking your pill um, and it's been more than three hours, you need to consider, um, you need a condom for two days and you may need to consider emergency contra contraceptive depending on when you've had sex. The desigestrol, however, has a window period of 12 hours, uh, which means that um, you can delay taking. So if you've forgotten taking the pill, it has a longer, um, you can delay taking the pill for up to 12 hours, sorry, before you need to consider emergency contraceptive and wearing condoms for two days. So the newer types are a lot more user friendly, let's say. The difference with these mini pills is that unlike the combined or contraceptive pills, you take the progesterone only pill every single day without any breaks. Again, if you start it within the first five days of your cycle, um, you need to consider wearing condoms for two days. Oh no, if you take it after the first five days of your cycle, you need to consider wearing condoms for two days. And these progesterone only methods, they work by um, causing, uh, reducing proliferation of the um, reducing proliferation of the endometrium um, which prevents implantation and also I mentioned this before as prevent um, thickening the cervical mucus which will prevent sperm essentially from entering. The desigestrol as well the new type of progesterone only pills can also prevent ovulation so that's a secondary benefit with the new uh, new generation of progesterone only pills. The implant um, is something uh, is a essentially a tube that you can put in your upper arm and it's usually inserted by a healthcare professional. Again, it prevents um, it thickens cervical mucus and prevents implantation, but the implant can also prevent ovulation. Um, and you and the great thing about the implant is that it lasts for three years. So you put it in and you can keep it in for three years. The depot injection is an intramuscular or subcutaneous injection you give every 12 weeks and it works in the same way that the implant does in terms of preventing ovulation and uh, decreasing proliferation of the endometrium um, and you give it every 12 weeks. Again with this one if you wear it if you start taking it um, in the first five days of your cycle you don't need to wear condoms but if you start using it 
after your five days of your cycle, of, if you start taking the injections after the first five days of your cycle, you need to wear condoms for seven days. There are lots of advantages with it. Again, similar to the combined methods, it's effective, sex is not disturbed. With the progesterone only pill and implant, you get your fertility coming back uh, relatively quickly. Progesterone only pill has also been used for treatment of menorrhagia um, and for painful periods as well. Um, and it can also reduce your risk of endometrial and ovarian cancer. Injection uh, can be good as well because you don't get any periods with it and you don't need to remember to take it every day. You just take an injection every 12 weeks and your implant is great because you put it in and you can leave it for three years. So you don't need to think about, you know, taking a pill every day or whatnot. There are disadvantages to note, though. Like with anything, there's no SCI protection. It can cause headaches, bloating, acne. Um, the key thing actually with injections, and this is a big caveat with taking the injections, is that it's not easily reversible. So when you take the injections, you do not get your fertility back as quickly as you do with the other methods. You can get weight gain and you can get increased uh, risk of osteoporosis. So you can't actually, you shouldn't actually give injections to adolescents, so particularly people under the age of 18. Um, and if you're over 50, you don't want to give people these injections. For the progesterone only pill, the window time, as I mentioned, is really short. Three hours is nothing, um, even though the new types um, have 12 hour window periods. Um, and the implants is a bit annoying because you need to put them in by healthcare professionals. So it just adds, I guess, that barrier. There are contraindications. Um, I've noted them down for the UK next three and four categories because those are essentially the main ones, main ones that you need to know of. But for the progesterone only pill, you don't want to give them if they've had a stroke, breast cancer, um, current will pass, and if they've got any uh, liver tumours or cirrhosis. For the implant, it's the same contraindications as the progesterone only pill but with the additional caveat of having unexplained vaginal bleeding, because that may be, um, that may lead to um, you questioning whether they could have any kind of vagina, uh, cancers around the vagina or um, any sort of cyst or something around the vagina causing this bleeding, of which you might want to be cautious before giving them the implant. And the injection, again, same, to, same as the implant and the progesterone only pill, but you get uh, contraindications with people with vascular disease or multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The last form of contraception I'm going to talk about is your marina, so your IUS, interuterine systems versus your IUD, so that's your interuterine device, so that's your copper coil. Your IUS, uh, the most popular one we know or most people will know is the marina coil um, and so that works by again preventing implantation and thickening cervical mucus um, it lasts for depending on what type of uh, rus you have in it the lasting time can be variable so the marina coil lasts around five years you have other types called the jadis and kylina which is another type of rus um, and those uh, and they last for variable times again but similar around three to five years with the IUS, similar to the other um, contraceptive methods, that if you put it in in the first five days of the cycle, you don't need to think about extra precautions. It's after the five days, you do need to think about wearing condoms for seven days. Your marina coil, on the other hand, is your copper coil. And what that does is that it's copper is essentially toxic to sperm. So um, it prevents fertilization and it also prevents implantation. Um, and the great thing about the copper coil, it can last five to ten years. So you can put it in, you can kind of forget about it. Um, and what is, again, quite unique about the copper cord is that once you put it in, it provides immediate contraception. So you don't need to think about any extra um, precautions that wearing condoms, depending on the day that you put it in um, on the day of your cycle. It provides immediate contraception. Again, with everything, advantages. The great thing about these interuterine uh, methods is that you can put them in, you can forget about it. Your fertility comes back relatively quickly. Your IUS or your aka marina coil or different types of coil can cause, um, uh, can give you lighter, less painful periods. And it's actually a treatment again for menorrhagia. And the uh, benefit with a copper coil is that it's non-hormonal. So quite, quite a lot of people like the idea of not having hormones. And 
So that's where you may want to offer the copper coil. And again, it provides um, immediate contraception. But with everything, there are their disadvantages, no STI uh, protection. There's an increased risk of ectopic pregnancy, although that risk is small. Uh, it is something that I guess you might want to think about. Um, it can sometimes be caused. I know the I, I mentioned the um, the marina coil or IUS can be helpful in heavy in treating menorrhagia. With the copper coil, it can actually cause more heavy and more painful periods. Um, and even though the marina coil might be helpful in uh, relieving symptoms of heavy periods or painful periods, it can actually also cause unpredictable bleeding, which can be quite annoying for people. And the insertion itself can be quite painful. And there are risks of having an interuterine device uh, because of things around uh, perforation and infection. Um, and that's something, again, that you need to think about and counsel people on. Contraindications, infection, that's the obvious one. Unexplained vaginal bleeding, again, because there's a risk if they're having unexplained vaginal bleeding, what about if they have any cancers? What about if they have um, a variety of different, um, they might have different, uh, uh, what's fibroids or other issues causing the vaginal bleeding, preventing you from putting anything into uterine. Pregnancy as well, if it's more than 48 hours or less than four weeks postpartum, you can't give um, anything into uterine. In uterine structural abnormalities, um, cancers, and other things around uh, with the copper core things, like obviously having a copper allergy um, and Wilson's disease, which is a little bit niche. And with the marina coil, things like different disease and history of breast cancer or stroke. SBA5. Hannah usually uses condoms for contraception. She had unprotected sexual intercourse, unprotected sexual intercourse on day 7 and 13 of a 28 to 31 day cycle. She is day 18 of her cycle now. Um, I'm going to give you guys about 30 seconds to answer this question. What... Um, what would you potentially give her or not give her? Okay, what other people thought? I know we don't have that actually that many people in, but let's see what's come up. Let's see, so yes, you can give her the copper coil because she's within five days of earliest predicted ovulation. So I'm going to go through all of that now. So, in emergency contraceptions, you have three options. So number uh, number one, you can give them the Levanol, um, and that's essentially a progesterone tablet. And the way that it works is that it delays ovulation. And you can give that within three days of having unprotected sex. Um, the great thing about Levanol is that if you give it, they can start a, another hormonal contraceptive straight away. And you can give them the Levanol pill within uh, twice within the same in the same cycle. Um, to note, though, um, if you vomit within three hours of taking this pill, it reduces its efficacy, so you, you will need to take it again. There isn't any actual contraindication to Levanol, which is a good thing, but there are circumstances where you need to double the dose to three milligrams. So, for example, if they've got any dis uh, diseases of malabsorption, so celiac disease, you're going to want to double the dose. And if they're taking P450 enzyme-inducing drugs, so those are your particularly thinking about um, epileptic drugs, for example, or if they've got um, a BMI of over 26 or they weigh over 70 kg, you're going to want to double the dose. LO1 is, again, another progesterone pill that you can take an emergency contraceptive. That has a window period of five days, so you can take it within five days of unprotective sex. Um, the caveat with taking the LO1 is that you cannot start them on hormonal contraceptive straight away. So if you want to give them, for example, if they want to start the combined pill after taking the LO1, you need to wait at least five days and they should be using barrier methods within this period. Um, 
Uh, it has recently been uh, licensed for use in the same cycle, for use twice in the same cycle. Um, and the only problem with LA1, again, is that there are lots of contraindications. So enzyme inducing drugs, so those are, for example, your anti epileptics. You would want to discard breast milk for seven days after taking your, the LA1 pill. Um, and again, you can't start them on hormonal contraceptive straight away. You need to wait five days after. And you can't use the LA1 if they've taken any hormonal contraceptive or. Um, the intrauterine system, so your marina coil, in the past seven days. So those are some additional caveats that you need to think about. The IUD is the most effective form of emergency contraceptive and one of the most effective uh, contraceptions in general, so that's your copper coil. And this one you can take five days after having unprotected sex or within five days of your earliest possible ovulation. So for example, if you have a 26 day cycle, to figure out the earliest day of ovulation, you minus 14 days. So 26 minus 14 is 12. So you can give the copper coil within one to 17 days. So it's um, uh, five days off. So it's within five days of your earliest possible uh, day of ovulation. So 12 plus 5 is 17. Yeah, I just added it. 12 plus 5 is 17. Uh, so you can give the copper coil within one to 17 days based on the rule of being able to give it within five days of your earliest possible ovulation. Um, that ruling though does have some caveats and that in that whole um, within five days of ovulation or within five days of having sex really confused me. So I was just going to give one kind of example, a scenario, a scenario example. So say for example if you have a 21 year old female, um, let's call her Bethany, who comes in saying that she wants the emergency contraceptive. There's a few things that you need to first ask her and figure out before you decide what emergency contraceptives she can have. So first you want to ask her how long, um, how long is her cycle? Um, and is it a regular cycle? And so she tells you she has a period every every month and it's a normal regular 28 day cycle. In real life, a lot of people don't actually know how many days their cycle is which can be very difficult, but in SBA land they will do. So it's a 28 day cycle. Say for example, and currently right now she's on day 18 of her cycle, which is today. She tells you that she had unprotected sex four days ago and nine days ago. So that's on day 14 and 19 of a 28 day cycle. You now need to figure out what is the earliest day of her ovulation. So you do 28 minus 14, so that's 14. So that's the earliest day of her ovulation. Plus five is 19. So that's within five days of her earliest day of ovulation. That is the kind of window period in which you can give the IUD. Um, it's really important to also, so even though she has had sex within, um, and it's been more than five days uh, in which she's had unprotected sex, because even though she's had sex four days ago, she has had sex nine days ago as well so she doesn't come under the iud category of sex um in within five days but she does come under the category of having the earliest day of ovulation being within five days because she's still on day 18 so she has one day left so she can technically have the iud you might not want to give her the ella one because even though her most recent unprotected sexual intercourse was within uh five days she has has had another um, event of unprotected sex after five days. So the LO1 may not be as effective. So that's when you want to go in with your copper coil because that will likely be more effective. And there's another slide as well. I just wanted to give this picture, which I found really useful when I was trying to understand emergency contraceptives and when you can give the IUD and not. Um, you can kind of go through this. You want to ask them, has it been more than five days or less than five days since they have unprotected sex? Yes. Have they had any more episodes of unprotected sex more than five days ago? And this is a really important question you need to ask. And don't forget that particularly in your OSCE scenarios, because you need to decide whether number one, unprotected, um, these kind of emergency contraceptives is going to be that useful or whether you need to give them pregnancy tests or whether it's actually safe to give them the copper coil. 
because you don't want to give them the copper coil if there's a risk that they have a pregnancy already. So you really need to make sure you ask that question. And then depending on that, you can go through a bunch of other stuff. I'm going to leave this picture is here on the slide, though. So please go through this in your own time. Um, and, and it can be quite a useful um, flow diagram to go through. Again, the disadvantages and advantages with the oral con uh, emergency pills uh, versus the copper coil. So with the oral methods, again, it's a one off tablet. Um, it doesn't involve any kind of procedure, but it is less effective. Um, and with the LO1, like I said, you do need to wait at least five days before starting any kind of oral contraceptive, any kind of hormonal contraceptive methods. The RUD is the most effective form of emergency contraceptive. But with anything like with with the disadvantages I mentioned with the copper coil, it can be painful and there are other risks around infections and um, uh, perforations and things like that. So that is something, again, to be to counsel people on. But if in doubt, levonorgestrel out, but IUDs have more clout. And what that slide is trying to say is that even if someone is coming in asking for emergency contraceptive, um, and you are unsure whether it's safe to give them a copper coil, um, you can always, there is no harm in giving the Levanol pill. Um, you should never really try not to deny people of having emergency contraceptive. There are contraindications with taking the level, uh, the LO1, but you can always give them the uh, Levanol pill because that doesn't have any um, absolute contraindications. And even if it's not effective, at least you've tried. But copper coils are a lot more effective. So I guess if people are OK with it and you counsel people adequately, try and it is safe for them to use, try to go for the copper coil option. And that is the end of my presentation or teaching. Um, I did speak a lot um, and I know that some of the stuff was probably a little bit rushed. But uh, please do fill out the feedback form and I'm happy to answer any questions that you ha may have now or um, if you email um, the med course, um, I will answer any questions that you guys may have through um, email as well. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Amazing, thank you Nazifa. And again, for anybody watching online or on YouTube, if you go through the feedback form, it will give you access to the slides once you submit the form. So as soon as you press submit, a link will pop up that gives you access to the slides. Um, we're co always contactable through our social medias at Med Crash Course. And again, a massive thank you to, for, uh, to Nazifa for giving up her time to educate us on this topic, which is a, an OSCE favourite, that's for sure. <laughs>